Uh, I'm interested in, first of all, uh, your career path, uh, starting with what made you interested in film to begin with, and how did you follow that goal? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I got interested at a young age, when probably when I was nine. My father had a, you know, the family 8mm camera, took home movies, and uh, pretty soon the kids got a hold of the camera. We started making movies of our own, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, including animation, and uh, I sort of followed through on that. Uh, through college, studied um, some film and television radio in college, and just uh, kept kept pursuing that. So what was it about editing, of, of, of all the kind of positions that you can pursue in film? What, hmm. what was it about editing that fit you? Yeah, I think it was mostly like it was quiet, it gave me a time to you know ponder over the footage and uh, it just i just took to it so well i didn't have you know i i couldn't imagine myself on a set directing people i'm just not that kind of a person mm-hmm. and it just felt like a comfortable place for me to be in and i know in you know some of the small things that i i did as a student that was uh the most fun for me is sitting with the footage and putting it together so i can you know if choosing a career in film that was the one place i could imagine myself being successful right in, in that early part uh, of your career, would you be able to tell me what the most valuable lesson you picked up that you've that you've carried on to this day? In the early, you mean in terms of like what I learned on projects? Mm-hmm. What's proven most valuable to you? Um, <laughs> patience. I know that. I know. I remember on one of the one of the films I made when I was a kid. I did two takes. I actually did two takes of something. It was a bicycle chase. And I learned that I I did a splice between the two takes right in the middle of a whip pan, and it was invisible. And I realized you can do things like that. You could totally fool the audience. Mm-hmm. And that's that stayed with me. Mm. And, and tell me about, because you've edited, obviously, outside of, uh, animated. Uh, I mean, you've you've worked on movies like Get Shorty and Men in Black and uh, mm-hmm. some great films. Uh, what what is different about the process when you're dealing with an animated feature? Well, it's very different. It's um, it's kind of a backwards process. I like to say that in live action, they shoot the film first and you edit later, and in animation, you edit first and then they shoot the film. And that's mm. the way it feels. Um, a lot of animation is um, cutting storyboards and laying the groundwork for what the film's going to be. And, um, you know, it's it's a complex process. There's a lot of elements that come into play, and uh, the process itself is much longer. You know, a live-action film could be, you know, maybe six months to eight months on the average. In animation... Uh, you, you could be cutting for three and a half years to five years. Mm. Mm. Well, when you describe it like that, that it's kind of you you de- you design, you kind of edit the film, and then you go out and shoot it. Uh, it. Does that leave any room for spontaneity or surprise or experimentation in the editing room? Well, always. I mean, that's what you aim for. You don't want it to get stale, and you always want to, you know make your cut feel like that's the first time it's happened, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, you want to make the dialogue sound spontaneous. So that's what you're always aiming for. But it does allow you for, you know, trying alternate cuts. And um, also in the case of animation, because, you know, as an editor, I'm involved in the story process. I'm essentially there working side by side with the writers and, and being involved as the story's developing gives us a chance to look at the movie and storyboard form as a whole and going back to the drawing board and making fixes story-wise. So it gives that, you know, that that's the kind of luxury we have in animation. Mm-hmm. And, Bobby, you were talking about how fascinated you were by uh, Ken's work with Pixar, this this style of editing. Tell me a little bit about that. What 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 are you taken by with that process? Well, I think it's it's so interesting that the editor has so much control and involvement, as Ken said, 
there are well first of all there's 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 a lot of I always feel that editors are and I think you agree with this that they're underappreciated and their their work is in great need of explanation and I think that's particularly true of the Pixar editor I had no idea what it what the process was and I think even I I know this to be true actually that even fellow editors have no idea, um, live-action editors. And one of the surprises is that, um, you know, that they're involved from the beginning, but also the the layout stage, which comes after the storyboard stage, is so interesting because it's it's where you, I mean, and that you actually have virtual cam- cameras and virtual sets, and it's really no different from live-action shooting, only... You can change it. You, you're not locked in at that point. You're really only locked in at the animation stage, and even then you can make minor changes, but then it becomes very expensive. But at the layout stage, where you really are blocking out and staging everything and, and making camera moves just the, just the way you would in different angles, different takes, and there's footage to choose from that a, an editor can cut, and and that can that is constantly morphing and changing and evolving and and that the editor is involved in it's as if the editor is sitting on the set and it and being involved in the process and before that sitting um at the screen at the screenwriting stage and at the the planning stage so there's every single there's no there's no pre-production production and post-production everything mm-hmm. sort of mushes together Mm-hmm. And the other part of it is that it, you can go insane because nothing is that everything is everything is at different stages at different times, and the editor is at the hub of it, and and there's just constant bits of media flowing in and out of the cutting room, and the editor has to keep track of it, and and you know Ken was talking about even at the storyboard stage it's like band aids you know you you mm-hmm. lock into a, to a sequence, and then the the actor comes in and does the final dialogue, and that that changes everything because they improvise. And so you you know it's the the challenge of it and the control is what mm-hmm. really impressed me. You know? So so Ken, do you do you often go insane uh, going through the process <laughs> that that Bobby just described? I would say I, I, about two years into it, I'm pretty much insane. There's a lot of <laughs> a lot of details to juggle. You know, at one point in the film. You're, you know, part of the film is in storyboards, part of it is in layout, some of it is being animated, and some of it is being rendered, and you're managing all this material while, you know, while still some of the scenes are being rewritten. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a crazy process, and like Bobby said, it's constantly changing. You think you're done with a cut, and then the next day, you know, some something comes in from a department that will change your cut, and you make adjustments. You're always keeping on top of it. It's like a living, breathing organism. Mm. And, he, and even when they preview Jamie, they're they're not even previewing the final version. They're pre, they have part of it is in storyboard. Yeah. You know that just shows how. Wow. You know. Yeah. So. And you know, we always feel like if you know if 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 uh, the movie plays in storyboard, it's going to play like Gangbusters, and when it's animated, you you just know the story's working and people are connecting to the characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we we you know we showed internally, you know, Toy Story three, and there's that scene at the end where Andy's giving his toys to Bonnie, and people are in tears, and these are drawings they're looking at. Wow! And you just know that when it's beautifully shot and animated, and the and the music's there, it's it's going to be amazing. Well, I can tell you, uh, Pixar films, particularly the Toy Story films. I mean, I'm, I'm like millions of people all around the globe. Uh, they tear me up. I mean, I, I, I am a teary mess at the at the end of these films. So, so thank you for that, personally. Uh, so, tell me about the. It, it, so, I would, I would think that concentration is the the major kind of uh, attribute uh, an editor has to have to be successful, especially under these conditions. Yeah, you sort of. Um you're using both parts of your brain as the part of your brain that's the technician and juggling and, you know, dealing with this Rubik's Cube of all the material coming in and making sure it doesn't fall out of sync. And then there's the other part of the brain is just playing the scene as a moviegoer and making sure it works on an emotional level and, you know, mm-hmm. plays story-wise. Um, so you, it really keeps you fully engaged. 
what I always am curious about from from uh, from editors, and I've asked Bobby this before, and, and other people that Bobby have, has brought onto the show, uh, is your how you maintain perspective, because mm-hmm. you're so close to it, you're reviewing so much footage, intricately involved in it. How, how do you how do you do that? How do you keep your eye on you know, mm-hmm. going from the smallest frame to the big picture? You know, I think you hit it on the head. That's the most the biggest challenge for me is keeping perspective, especially after you've been working on it for years. You have to remember, you know, the very first cut and, you know, like we were talking the other day about jokes that work that don't get a laugh two years later because you've seen it so many times. Mm-hmm. And you have to remember, oh, yeah, that used to work. And, you know, there's no need to change it. Um, but in terms of perspective, uh, you know, Sometimes you just have to put a scene down and walk away from it and go back to it later. Mm -hmm. Um, And I show other people. It helps to show assistants and see it through their eyes. And then the film itself, it's always beneficial. We, we, um, you know, we screen it periodically at Pixar in the main theater and bring in different departments who haven't seen the film yet, so it's fresh to them. And it's really helpful to get their reaction to the film. And that's the way you keep the, um, you know, your perspective on things. Mm Mm-hmm. So when you do these events, uh, Ken, um, because you've 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 done Q and A's in the past, mm-hmm. uh, what what do people most want to know about what it is you do? What are they most confused about? I mean, it's really the basics. After I go through the process, I think it's pretty overwhelming. Like so. Um, you know, you mean the dialogue comes first and then they animate, you know, the really mm-hmm. rudimentary stuff? Um, well, I don't know. I think they're surprised that the uh, the actors uh, d- don't act the scene together. You know, every actor records their lines completely separate at a different time in a different studio, and I have to build the performance from scratch mm-hmm. and make it sound like they're in the same room together. But I don't know what the commonality is with the uh you know the confusion from the audience. I think it's a, there's a lot of it's it's you know all new concepts, it's a lot to grasp. So is that would be a challenge to to make it sound like it, it, it there is a real interaction there between the characters when, oh, when they're recorded separately. Yeah. yeah, you I mean hats off to the director who 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 you know maintains consistency across performances because if you've got Tom Hanks shouting on one side and Tim Allen quietly talking on the other side, it won't quite cut together. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of things you're looking for is, you know, the, the same energy level and, um, you but know. You're also, as an editor, because of that, you have to control the pacing of the scene in a way that's more challenging than a live-action editor. Yeah, I completely am in charge of the, the pacing and how tight the dialogue is, where the pauses are. I, it's completely fabricated. In the, in the editing process, you're not, you know, in live action, you'll see the master and maybe get a sense of the actor's rhythm. And for me, it's really creating that rhythm. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is just a, a comment. That I, I, I don't know that there's a question in here, but we were doing a show uh, months ago about our favorite sequences from films. And I think there's kind of a, a, a misconception or people overlook the animated films in terms of the confidence of how certain scenes are constructed because i i said i did say just look at toy story 3 mm-hmm. i mean the 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 framing the the uh, the the blocking of the characters the editing that is some of those sequences are as confident as anything you'll find in the best spielberg movies you know and Someone editing has never editor. been and editors have never been nominated for academy awards and it's a travesty uh, in mm. animation. I mean, it's it's a travesty, really. And I'm I'm determined to uh, contribute to correcting that. <laughs> yeah, let's let's fix that. <laughs> let's fix that. Um, and cinematography, by the way, and special mm. effects. I think even I'm not sure about that, but I just um, I really do mm-hmm. feel that um, it's it's not you know like like the, the the dialogue is one part of it, but there's so many aspects of of the choices that the editor is involved in are just are just mind blowing in terms of 
animation. People just have no idea. I think they just think that, you know, you you just take shots and they, they just take shots and cut them together and cut off the ends of them or something. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, um, I mean, cell animation was very different, the old-fashioned kind of not 3D animation. It was the editor's involvement was much more limited because yeah. once you were, isn't that true, Ken, once you, they, the storyboards were done. The editor really wasn't that involved anymore. I mean, yeah, my yeah. sense is that they just pretty much built on what the, you know, the the, the story reel itself and base layout on that and move forward. Um, but in, you know, once you you're working in the three dimensional world, you have you know, the sky's the limit, and you could, you know, give yourself a lot of coverage and uh, give you a lot of flexibility. In the editing, and, you're not like locked into anything really. And the other thing, the other aspect of it, and uh, is what's unique to Pixar animation is there's a reason why they're the most successful studio in the history of film. Um, there's a um, degree of perfectionism. As there's a there's a line that that they, they sand the underside of the drawers, <laughs> meaning that that you know that they just and there's something called plussing it, which Ken and I just talked about today. Which is you, you, it was, which was a phrase coined by Disney actually, and and Walt Disney was really an inspiration for Pixar Studios. But this this level of just never stopping and never mm-hmm. just going to the nth degree to get everything so wonderful on every level, you know, and in terms of detail and story and character and and gearing the movies for the child in all of us, not for children. Yeah, you know. I I wanted to ask you about that because Pixar is so incredibly successful. And so I wanted to know from you, from an insider's perspective, what's it like to be a part of that family and and, and how do you define what makes them uh, unique and and special, Hmm. Ken? Well, I know that working there, I mean, you're just working side by side with such extraordinarily talented people. And, you know, when you hand a shout off to another department, you know it'll come back you know, so much better and it'll be a surprise and that's what we talk about in terms of plussing it. Um, but there is a, there is a, I think there's a, just somehow in the culture built into it is all these high standards. We really expect a lot from each other and it, it, it makes you better just somehow just being there. And right. very collaborative. I mean, Ken, you talked about how it was an adjustment actually, the fact mm-hmm. that you're constantly, they constantly um, not only collaborate, but critique each other in a way that it's across the board, so everybody gets critiqued all the time, yeah. and it's it's really ultimately very positive. You have to check your ego at the door a little bit, and then mm-hmm. give into that wonderful culture of we're all in this together, and we're all helping each other. You know? Right. And and tell me what was unique uh, about the, the Toy Story three experience. What made that kind of a, a singular experience from the other work you've done with Pixar? I think that, you know, there was the legacy of the other two films to live up to. I mean, they're just such great films, and it's so daunting to think we're doing a sequel to that, but we really <laughs> set our standards high and um, just rolled up our sleeves and, you know, managed to do that. I think uh, just knowing that and then, you know, uh, continuing, you know, having to have the consistency of the the, the characters, the personalities, and right. you know, honor that. You know, there's a certain responsibility you have by having a sequel. Right, and and it all, is all about the characters, and I think that's what makes the Pixar films stand out, especially the the Toy Story series. Is mm-hmm. is is that it's all about their journey, and and audiences mm-hmm. feel a, a genuine uh, empathy for all of those characters. Yeah, absolutely. They really feel connected and yeah. really care about what, what what's going to happen and their real, uh, uh, you know, in a way, adult issues they're dealing with. Exactly, yeah. It was their effort, uh, because I, when I saw Toy Story 3, I mean, I was very moved by it, but I was also very taken by uh, several moments that were were very uh, intense, very kind of scary. I'm, I'm thinking of when they almost got incinerated, and, mm-hmm. I, and I was kind of terrified. Terrified at that yeah. scene. W- were there conversations about how how far to go, or with that kind of content? Or? Well, we just went for it. 
um, because, you know, that was a key scene, and it needed to be there, and, you know, the concept was always, you know, what's the end game for a toy? What is their absolute worst nightmare? And that would be the mm-hmm. thrown out and incinerated, and that's the end of it. So that that scene had to be there, but we... You know, it was pretty amazing once, you know, it was one thing to watch it in storyboards, but when that thing came in lit and with the effects in it, it's like, oh, my gosh, this is like, it's a, it's big and it's scary. And we we were wondering how the kids would take it. And, and uh, some, you know, we didn't have a problem, though, in the uh, previews uh, with children. Um, that wasn't a big complaint, so we thought we were okay. It's 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 def it definitely got me. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, it, it it worked for the film, mm-hmm. uh, absolutely. So tell me about uh, Edit Fest, Bobby. Tell me about uh, the event, where our listeners can can check out your Q and A with with Ken. Um, it's going to be well, Edit Fest is actually taking place Friday and Saturday. It starts Friday night. There's one panel Friday night, and then there's four panels on Saturday, and we're the second panel, which is 11:45. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's um, it's a wonderful event. I've been doing it since it started uh, in L.A. and New York. I think it's it's both both for aspiring filmmakers, for the public, and working. There's a lot of working editors that come to this, which is interesting. Which means there's you know there's always a growth curve there. Yeah. And there's always so much to learn from these master editors. And um, Edifice was very generous in letting me do what I wanted to do, which was do a panel solely with Ken. I really liked the one-on-one interaction mm-hmm. of of really an interview format, as you can relate to, Jamie. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, as I told you, I spent many, many hours talking to Ken about this, and I uh, I went to Pixar Studios initially to visit Ken and was fascinated by his explanation of his process and he was responding to my my great curiosity in a, such a satisfying way that I just really wanted to um to share his insights with with the um Edifest audience. I really think mm-hmm. there's you know it's it's um it, it it describes a lot that I mean it's sort of like an extreme version of being an editor. <laughs> All the all the decisions and the creative process that that an editor goes through at Pixar is just it's it's like an uh, idealized and terrifying world for an editor, <laughs> and <laughs> there's just so much that the editor is involved with. So it's it's almost exposes you know an, the editing process in an in, in an, a very intense way and the filmmaking process as well because the editor is so involved in the filmmaking process that there's there's so much to learn, I think, from our panel, and and as I said, the Pixar films, the the ethos of Pixar is very inspiring, and yeah. I think you know just all that I've learned from Ken and researching, I've read everything I could possibly find on Pixar as well, and the more I read, the more I'm just, I find it incredibly inspiring, and I think Ken is a is a great communicator of his craft. 